Everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Today, I am with Dr. Michael Bruce, who is a clinical psychologist and both a diplomat of the American Board of Sleep Medicine and a fellow of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. He was one of the youngest people in the world to have passed the board at age 31 and specializing in sleep disorders. He's one of 163 psychologists in the world with these credentials and this distinction. Dr. Bruce is the only is on the clinical advisory board of the Dr. Oz show and appears regularly on the show over 30 times in the last four years. And he's known more generally by as the sleep doctor. So welcome, I Dr. Think. Bruce. <laughs> hey, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. And it was great to meet you, uh, very, albeit very briefly, a couple yeah. weeks ago at uh, the Consumer Health Summit. Yeah, no, I, it was a lot of fun. That was a great summit, by the way. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, and in general, I'm a huge fan of your work. I've read your Thank book. You. I've read tons of articles of yours online, and uh, it's heavily influenced my own stuff. I'm, I'm a awesome. geek on circadian rhythm stuff, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a fan of yours. So Super cool. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I guess to get us started, I mm -hmm. think what would be helpful for people, a lot of people have never even heard of this term, circadian rhythm. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, let's, we, can, we can certainly start there. And just to give everybody a little bit of background on me, um, so I'm an actively practicing sleep doctor. So I treat patients with apnea, narcolepsy, insomnia, all that kind of stuff. And circadian rhythms uh, is something that uh, there are actually circadian rhythm disorders that are out there. And, and, but first, before we talk about that, let's talk about what is a circadian rhythm. So it turns out that sleep is run by two distinct systems in the brain. One is a sleep drive. Um, it's kind of like hunger, right? So I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. I eat something and that hunger begins to dissipate. Same holds true with sleep, is sleep actually builds throughout the day. If you look at it neurochemically, it turns out that there's, uh, when a cell eats a piece of glucose, something comes out the back end. One of those things is something called adenosine. Adenosine is this byproduct and it filters its way through your blood and gets to your brain and has these very specific receptor sites just for adenosine that clicks in. When you get enough of them clicking in, you get sleepier and sleepier and sleepier. Um, now, what's kind of cool about this is if you look at the molecular structure of adenosine and the molecular structure of caffeine, they're off by one molecule. Um, so caffeine actually fits into that receptor site and so it blocks the adenosine and so sometimes when you're drinking caffeine The reason that you feel that energy is because that adenosine is getting blocked But of course once your body or your brain rather burns through that caffeine The adenosine comes flooding through and that's when you get that caffeine crash So that's part of the system called your homeostatic drive for sleep or I just call it the sleep drive Right, there's a whole second system called your circadian rhythms. That's what we're going to talk about more today Circadian rhythms are, are really interesting because your body, you ever notice how your body only gets hungry like at breakfast, lunch, and dinner? It's kind of that, those times when your body is going to be doing that. Same holds true with sleep. Is on the average Americans, we see average time that people have a tendency to get sleepy is right around 1030 at night. Turns out that this is all based on the core body temperature rhythm. So as your core body temperature rises and rises and rises, once it hits its peak and it kind of starts to tip downwards, that's the time that your circadian rhythm produces or tells your brain to produce melatonin. So remember, melatonin is kind of that key that starts the engine for sleep. And this is all kicked off on a very predictable pattern called your circadian rhythm. So, it la so the rhythm lasts a roughly 24 hours. It's a little bit more, a little bit less, 24 hours, depending on who you are. Beautiful. So how does that relate to sleep you know a lot we hear a lot of people talking about sleep and 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 you know in, in the health sphere you don't hear people talking about circadian rhythm so much right. you hear people talking about you know just get seven to eight hours of sleep right so i i, I would love if you could draw a distinction for people around for sure. where, circadian rhythm and sleep and what's the difference between optimizing circadian rhythm versus right. just getting eight hours of sleep so here's what's cool about circadian rhythms is there's not just one there's literally over a hundred in your body Every organ system has its own circadian rhythm. Believe it or not, even diseases have their own circadian rhythm. Um, there's a lot of interesting research in that area. And so circadian rhythms are not just when does your body want to go to sleep. It's when does your body want to eat? When does your body want to exercise? When, do you, when does your body want to think? When do you want to have brainstorming? When do you, every single activity that you can imagine that you do is affected by circadian rhythms. And so sleep is like the anchor. And what's interesting is it's all genetically predetermined. There's, a, there's over 80 different markers in the body for circadian rhythm. So like if you did a 23andMe test, you know, the saliva test, you could go. They can actually tell you. They, they look at all these 80 different markers. They can tell you if more of an early bird or a night owl or things like that. 
Um, so there's a lot of biology behind all of this. But what's, what's fascinating is, is your sleep time, again, which is genetically predetermined, is when you start, right? And then when you wake up, all the hormones start to kick in. And that's where it gets super cool because we know that hormones run on a very predictable pattern. So your cortisol, your melatonin, um, epinephrine, uh, serotonin, like everything you can imagine runs on a very particular pattern. And so where it's really getting interesting as far as circadian rhythms are concerned and kind of where we're seeing medicine in general uh, start to move is we can actually leverage our circadian rhythms and figure out the best time of day to do literally just about anything. And so that's what my new book is all about, The Power of When, which is when should you do stuff, right? And it's all based on this anchor of your circadian rhythm and then everything else that goes on during the day, we can pick and choose exactly the right time to do stuff. Yeah, beautiful. So I, I think that's a natural segue into chronotypes. So if, oh, yeah. if you could talk a little about what chronotypes are, I know in your book, you talk mm -hmm. about dolphins, lions, yeah. uh, bears, wolves. And yeah. so what's, what's that all about? Okay. So don't get scared by the animals. Um, <laughs> all right. So what I wanted to do was um, I was looking to better understand these chronotypes. And so first of all, what does that word mean? Chronotype. So it means a genetically predetermined sleep schedule. That is a chronotype. Now, you may not have heard the word chronotype before, but I'm sure you've heard of people being called an early bird or a night owl. Those are chronotypes. It turns out there's not just two. Uh, it turns out that there's actually four. And this research has actually been around for almost 10 years now. Um, what I wanted to do was find a way to identify those four chronotypes because I had patients who were coming in to see me and they would say, I don't want to sleep at 1030 at night when the average person wants to go to sleep. I want to go to bed at 830 and I like to wake up at 4.30. Well, those are people that would be early birds, right? But I call them lions. Um, I changed the symbolism and the animals um, for two distinct reasons. Number one, I'm a mammal, not a bird. And so <laughs> I was like, I wanna have a mammal in there. Um, number two, I actually chose mammals that had these circadian rhythms. Mm -hmm. So lions, which is my early bird, uh, these are people who, so lions in general in the animal kingdom, their first kill is at dawn. They're very early morning creatures. By the late afternoon, they're zonked. They're ready to go to bed. They're like kind of chilling out. Um, lions actually have very specific personality characteristics. And I was able to discover this um, because I have a quiz that people can take to figure out what their chronotype is. Um, and I, I ask them very specific questions about personality. I ask them questions about what time of day do they like to do things. I ask them questions about what their favorite meal is. And then you're probably sitting there saying, Michael, what could a favorite meal have to do with it? Well, it turns out early birds love breakfast, but night owls hate it. And so it's actually a fairly easy way to identify it. Mm -hmm. So what are my lions? My lions are my real go-getters. They have a tendency to wake up between 5 and 5.30 in the morning, but they're going to bed at 8.30 at night, um, which is not so good for their social life, by the way. Dinner in a movie for a lion never seems to happen, only dinner, because <laughs> they're falling asleep by the time. Because they've been up since 4.30 in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. um, but these are my COOs of a company. They're my type A personalities. They'll make a list at the beginning of the day and go from step one to step two to step three. Like they're very orderly, almost kind of military in their thinking. Um, very good at organizing people. Uh, the next, which are people in the middle, are called, I call them bears. Um, historically, the research would call them hummingbirds, um, but bears are the best. They make up almost 55% of the population. And um, the world works on a bear schedule. So do bears, you say that they're the best because you're a bear? Is that your no, secret? No, I'm a wolf, actually. Okay. <laughs> I'm a wolf. I think bears are the best because um, it's so much easier for a bear, quite honestly. Like the world works on their schedule. Like for mm. bears, going to work at nine o'clock and leaving at five o'clock works perfectly for their circadian rhythm. Whereas for me, and I'm a night owl or a wolf, it's terrible. Like I hate mornings. The only thing I hate worse than mornings are morning people. I've told that to people all the time. Like, <laughs> don't talk to me in the morning, especially if you're one of these chipper, not that I hate you, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just not chipper in the morning. Like, I'm not there. I don't have that level of energy. I mean, we're, we're doing this at, it's four o'clock in the afternoon, our time. This is my perfect time. Like, I've got lots of energy. I'm wide awake. Like, I'm reeling off data. Like, it's perfect for me to do stuff at this particular time because I'm sort of more of a late night creature. But back to bears. The reason they're so good is it's so much easy for them. They're very, um, they're very nice people. Um, they're really good friends. They also have a tendency um, to be the people that are a little bit more social, a little bit more extroverted. Um, if you're going out to lunch with a group of bears, they're telling funny stories and laughing at each other. They're the per first person at the bar to buy drinks for everyone, that kind of stuff. Um, they really get the work done. 
So lions have a tendency to be more managerial. Bears have a tendency to like get in there and make shit happen, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, wolves, which is what I am, are night owls. So wolves have a tendency to be a little bit more introverted. I'm not really that way much myself, but most of my wolves are. And what's really fascinating is um, wolves have a tendency to be my creatives. So they're my actors, my authors, my... Um, my musicians, people like that, because they're night people, right? And so they love, for them, they don't want to go to bed before 12, 31 o'clock. I can honestly tell you, I can't remember the last time I went to bed before midnight. Wow. Um, because that's just not how I operate. You know, like I am much more of a night person. And wolves themselves, the creatures, um, are nocturnal anyway. They hunt at night. You know, they're very nocturnalish creatures. Um, and then finally, are my problem children. So my dolphins. Um, <laughs> so um, I love my dolphins to death, um, but they, they definitely have an erratic sleep schedule. Um, I chose dolphins. This is kind of an interesting little side note. Um, dol most people don't know this, but dolphins sleep what's called unihemispherically. So half of their brain is asleep while the other half is awake and looking for predators. Mm. And I thought that was kind of this interesting representation of my patients who just don't feel like they sleep very well or have insomnia. Um, my dolphins are usually my very erratic sleepers. They are usually self-diagnosed as insomnia. They may have some other health complaints as well. Super intelligent and also much like a lion in that they're very type A personalities, but they have just a little bit of obsessive compulsive in them and they have a hard time finishing projects in their mind. Like if somebody walked by a dolphin's desk, they would be like, holy cow, this person's amazing. But the dolphin themselves would be like, oh no, 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 this stuff isn't ready for prime time yet. Mm -hmm. So very different from a personality perspective. And so once you figure out which one of these four chronotypes you are, then it gets super cool because I know exactly when your hormones are doing different things throughout a 24 hour period. Because as an example, when a lion wakes up at five o'clock in the morning, that's their start time for all of their hormones. Whereas a wolf like me, if I wake up at 7 30, 8 o'clock, that's my start time for my hormones. And we can follow these hormones and again, pick the right time to do anything from have sex to eat a cheeseburger to run a mile to ask your boss for a raise. It's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so I have a couple questions around this. I, I, mm -hmm. First, I would say, I feel like I don't fit neatly into one of these types. Uh -huh. um, That's common, actually. We have hybrids. Okay. Okay, so I'm I'm definitely not a dolphin, but I'm. Did you take the quiz? Yes, and I've I went through the book and read all the characteristics of the different book, and I the truth is I can feel pieces of each one. So oh, like I okay. have the creativeness to me. I'm not very uh -huh. Type A, but I'm more of like a lion schedule. Not quite that uh -huh. early, not four thirty in the morning, but more right. like six. Okay, um, and I do wake up with lots of energy, and I do, uh -huh. you know, get my best work done at the beginning of the day. Interesting. Um, so you would probably be um, what I would call a bear lion, right? Okay. So you're somebody who's in the middle, but you have a tendency to fade to the earlier side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and when you were younger, were you always this way? Did you always wake up at 630 in the morning or did you sleep in and stuff like that? Uh, pretty much always this way. Okay. So then you're, you probably actually were a lion when you were much younger and you started to kind of fade a little towards the middle. Um, as you get older and you, people move by the way throughout their chrono throughout their lives through different chronotypes mm -hmm. as an example I've got a 15 year old son and a 13 year old daughter. They are wolves for sure. Yeah um, But that's how lots of teenagers are right because teenagers like to stay up until 2 and sleep until 12 Right, and that's a classic kind of wolf schedule So yeah. we know that what I call chrono longevity can change over time meaning as you get older different things can kind of happen Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting that you, you fell into several categories. If you had to guess, what were your parents? Um, bears. So most people fall in line with whatever their parents were. Actually, my, my mom is a lion for sure. Okay. So see how I said, I think you're a yeah. bear with a little bit of lion in you. Yeah. Your dad was probably a bear. Your mom was probably a lion. And henceforth, we get you. Right, yeah. which and now we're getting at, we're also getting at my mommy issues right now, as far as <laughs> being bossed around my whole life. <laughs> so so it's good. we'll do that. It's good. I'm talking to a psychologist. Right Absolutely. Now. <laughs> it is. We can do therapy for you later. Don't worry. <laughs> so um, on this notion of chronotypes, mm -hmm. there's, so I've seen some of the, the research that you re referred to around chrono longevity and how it yep. changes over time. Sure. Uh, I think one thing that's interesting is how, social influences can change our chronotype. Like mm -hmm. for example, I'm, I'm curious how much, uh, actually let me rephrase this. I, my personal opinion is I think there are a lot less wolves out there mm -hmm. than 
than people think, or sure. I, I think there are a lot of people who, who, who think they're wolves who are not actually wolves. Yeah, uh, I would agree with you. Um, okay. It runs about 10, 12% wolves and about 10, 12% lions, 50, 55% bears and about 10% dolphins. Okay. Because I think there's a lot of people who, who got shifted into that night owl rhythm by virtue of the fact that we ha- we live in a world that disrupts our circadian rhythm. I agree. And, you know, there was a recent study I, I saw where they took a bunch of people and put them out like into an outdoor environment, essentially on a, mm-hmm. on a camping trip. Yeah. The insomnia so, camping trip. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. And it was all, super cool. And their insomnia gone. Yeah. Their insomnia is gone. And all of a sudden their circadian clocks got shifted, exactly. um, shifted back a couple hours. So they're mm-hmm. no longer night owls. Right. Right. Yeah. And so, and, and that's actually a perfect example. I'm so glad you brought up that example. That's a perfect example of how we've got all these influences, right. That are all over us, right. We've got internet, we've got blue light, we've got, you know, our, our significant other that's waking us up because they want to tell us something or going to bed when they, when we don't want to, or what have you, we've got children, we've got pets, we've got all these different influences on our time. Right. And so timing turns out to be really important, you know, and, and when we're talking about your area of expertise, which is energy and reduction of fatigue and, and those kind of things, the thing that we all want to start thinking about is, are there natural times in our circadian 24 hour cycle where we'll naturally have more energy and naturally have less energy? And, and what do we want to do about those? Things? Yeah. So let's get into that. So how, sure. I, I mean, I guess let's use, I guess, lions, bears, and wolves uh-huh. and, and talk about, you know, what are the best, the most energetic, productive times of day and how can they use that to their advantage? Sure, sure. Um, so just for everybody out there, if you want to try to figure out what your uh, chronotype is, check out thepowerofwhenquiz.com. Um, so you can know, because I want everybody to be able to participate in the, in the podcast for sure. Yeah. Um, so when we're looking at energy levels, there, there are on times and there are off times. And, and what's interesting is if you look at the data, um, it depends on what you want to do. So as an example, if you want to brainstorm or solve a problem, believe it or not, you don't want to do it during an on time. You actually want to do it in an off time. And I'll tell you why. So when you look at creativity, um, there are several different rhythms like we're talking about that affect creativity. So there's actually four. So one is called the connectivity rhythm. So uh, have you ever heard of people being called uh, right-brained or left-brained? Yeah. Right. And so that's actually real. We know that a lot of people, they, the majority of the activity happens on one side of the head or the other. Well, right after you wake up in the morning, both sides are talking. Mm. So that's a connectivity rhythm. So you want to have both sides talking, especially to solve a problem. Second thing you want to think about is REM sleep. So it turns out that during REM sleep, which is the sleep where your eyes move back and forth and you have the most likelihood of dreaming, um, that's where you move information from your short-term memory to your long-term memory. Okay, and you actually create an uh, intellectual substructure for information in your brain. So, oh my gosh, Michael, what does that have to do with brainstorming? Well, if you're trying to solve a problem, you need each of these pieces of information in the filing cabinet in the right place and connections have to be made to them. And that's actually what we think dreaming is, is making connections between pieces of information. Mm -hmm. And so what's super cool is if you're trying to solve a problem or brainstorm a problem, you want to sleep on it. Right. And you know, that old adage, oh, sleep on it and you'll feel better in the morning. It really works, especially when you're trying to be on or brainstorm. Right. So, but believe it or not, I call these times moments of groggy greatness. Okay. And here's why is because the distraction that you have in the early morning is actually pretty good. So how many times have you been you know, taking a shower and you have like this amazing idea that you think is going to cure something and make you a million bucks and all these different things. That's also something that has a tendency to happen very early in the mornings. Um, And it's a distraction rhythm. It's kind of interesting where if your brain is sort of distracted by some manual technique, like taking a shower or going for a run or being on a treadmill or a bicycle, um, it gives your other part of your brain time to really start to move around that piece of information and kind of get there. And then the final rhythm has to do with dopamine. And so it has to do with new experiences. And so when you put yourself into places of new experiences or you meet somebody for the first time or or, or get get to reacquaint yourself with them, it fires off dopamine in your brain. And that also helps with the creative process as well. So if you're looking to brainstorm, you're actually going to not want a time where you have high energy. You're going to want to have a time where you have the sort of this groggy greatness. And so that's going to be very early in the morning, literally within 20 minutes of you waking up. Or it's going to be later on in the, in the mid to late afternoon, somewhere between like one and four o'clock in the afternoon. 
Um, we all kind of get sleepy around that period of time. Turns out our core body temperature has a small dip uh, somewhere between one and three in the afternoon, which sends off a little bit of melatonin. So that's what makes us a little bit sleepy. But that level of grogginess can actually be leverageable to be able to think through or brainstorm different ideas. But let's say that you, did, you wanted your on times. You wanted your times where you are popping, you're ready to get stuff done, whether it's work out or um, be on stage or whatever it is that you happen to be. Those times are actually kind of different. Um, so those times have a tendency to occur right before lunch. So somewhere between like 10.30 and 11.30, 12 o'clock for, uh, for different chronotypes can actually be really good. For example, that time is great for a bear, but for a lion, it's about an hour earlier. Mm. And for a wolf, it's about an hour later, right? And so when you start to think through these ideas of when am I going to be on, that's when you're going to want to be doing stuff like, like I said, doing a presentation or paying your bills, right? Or going through a bunch of emails, something that's going to require a good bit of, fo of focus. That's when you kind of want your on times to be. So that, that usually happens about four hours after you actually initially wake up. Interesting. So what about things like exercise or sex? Are there mm -hmm. best times to do those things? Yes, but they're not the same for those two different activities. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when you, look at, when you look at exercise, so I'm a, are you a runner? Uh, more of a weightlifter, rock climber, surfer. Okay, so but you do a lot of cardio. Only I mean, surfing all, and rock all, climbing. Yeah, to some extent, M mainly surfing. Mainly, mainly surfing. Oh, yeah. that's cool. I do surfing too. Um, nice. So when you look at people who are doing cardio, there, you want to first of all ask yourself, well, what is the reason why I'm doing the cardio, right? So as an example, are you trying to burn fat or are you trying to get a better time, right? So if I, if you're a runner, I'm also a runner. Um, I run because I'm a wolf. I will run later in the afternoon, even early evening, because that's when my body is ready to do that. If I try to run at 6.30 in the morning, I'm almost guaranteed to get injured because my coordination is off, my muscles haven't warmed up, like it's a, it's a friggin' mess for me, right? Mm -hmm. But if I was a lion, it'd be one of the first things I'd wanna do because mm -hmm. lions wake up super alert, ready to rock and roll, and they can really kind of accomplish that. If I was, um, if I was looking to burn fat, then you want to actually exercise in the morning because you, you, if you have an empty stomach, you got to get the fuel from somewhere. So you're going to get it from fat. So again, what is your object of your game with your level of exercise? What do you want to do? Um, there's a lot of data looking at professional athletes. And one of the things we've discovered is if they train at roughly the same time as they compete, they actually do better yeah um than, than they normally would have. And it's kind of cool now, almost every major sports team has a sleep specialist associated with it. Yeah. Um, that is the new secret weapon for everybody out there is getting better sleep. Because, you know, these athletes are tested, you know, the second they walk off the field for performance-enhancing drugs and all that kind of stuff. And, and I can tell you the difference between being on the podium and off the podium in the Olympics is a good night's sleep the night before. Yeah, very interesting. So um, one, what related, about sex? Well, actually, before we get into that, staying on okay. the topic of exercise, does exercise type matter? Does it matter whether we're talking about weightlifting or cardio? It can, actually. So when we look at, for example, training for strength, um, like, again, if you're doing cardio, then based on your chronotype, um, you're going to want to do it a little bit earlier in the day, um, for bears especially. It's kind of weird for bears, if they don't exercise in the beginning of the day, they just won't do it. Mm. They just their motivation just goes straight down. So lions and bears, I having I'm having them exercise fairly early. Um, believe it or not, dolphins. Remember my problem, children. They're really good at exercising in the morning because it calms them down. Mm -hmm. Like it takes that nervous energy that they have and calms them down. Whereas wolves, like myself, we're much better to exercise at night. Like generally speaking, I try to exercise four times a week, and I don't usually exercise most days until about eleven in the morning mm -hmm. um, because that's kind of a good time for me to be able to do it for my day, but I actually prefer doing it closer to like six thirty, seven o'clock at night. That's the, so 11 a.m. is like first thing after waking up for you as a night owl. Well, it's, <laughs> it's not exactly, but it's pretty close. Um, I, if, I, if I had my druthers, I would be getting up around 8, 8.30 most days, but I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I can't do that because I got kids. Um, yeah. And that's a whole other area we can talk about that as well. Yeah. Um, but for strength training, it turns out that um, muscle growth doesn't matter. You can train any time of the day for muscle growth, but for muscle strength, which is different, um, you want to follow the, the ideas behind chronotype. So again, lions are going to exercise a little bit earlier, um, bears more in the middle of the day, wolves in the evening. Okay. Now, what if you're 
if you're a bear or if you're a wolf, but mm. the, the, the only time that you have available is let's say the morning. And that's right. the only time you can exercise. Will your body get entrained to that pattern? And so it becomes easier, like your body learns to expect mm -hmm. exercise at that mm -hmm. time? It will, depending upon how frequent you do it, okay. right? And so if you're only exercising twice a week, no, it's probably not going to get that. But once you hit like the three, four times a week mark, your body starts to get used to looking for exercise kind of at that point in time. And remember, it's much easier for a bear to do that than for a wolf because right. we just hate the mornings. <laughs> Okay, so what about sex? So sex is a question I get asked everywhere I go. And so I'm going to give you a general understanding of sex and circadian rhythms and then more specific. So here's what's interesting is in order to have good sex, um, you need several hormones. So you need progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, you need cortisol and adrenaline all need to be high and melatonin needs to be low. Okay, 93% of sexual activity occurs between 1030 and 1130 at night. Wow. All right. If you look at the profile, the hormone profile, I'll give you one guess what it looks like. High it's melatonin. the opposite. Yeah. Right. You got high melatonin and all those other things are low. So you heard it here from the sleep doctor. You should be having sex in Saturday morning. morning, somewhere between like eight and nine in the morning. So everybody out there who's listening, do this experiment with your partner. Go ahead and try having sex in the morning. You will be surprised. Number one at your performance, but more importantly, your connection to that individual. You will feel more from an emotional standpoint. You will, um, you'll have a heightened sense of sensitivity. Um, it's very, very different um, than having sex at night. Now, if let's say you've got kids, okay, and kids are wandering into your bedroom at 8 o'clock in the morning, it's just not going to be able to work, then look at earlier in the evening. Look at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the evening. You really just want to stay away from those late, late nights because – Again, melatonin is high, all the other hormones are low, it's not gonna work out very well for you. We think this may be one of the reasons why um, men have a tendency to fall asleep after sex, especially in the evenings, is because their melatonin levels are very, very high, and once they expend their testosterone and their um, adrenaline, they crash very, very quickly. Whereas women, it's a much slower decline on that curve. And so that's why a lot of women don't get sleepy right after sex. In fact, some women actually report that they feel more energized after sex. Yeah. Yeah. Now, very interesting. Now, now here's the really interesting question. What happens if you're a lion and your partner is a wolf? Ooh. Right. That's where it gets kind of funky. So I actually created a matrix in the book so you can put in your chronotype across the top and their chronotype across the side, and it actually you can find the points. And then I created two other matrices. One, uh, there's a heterosexual one, there's one for uh, lesbian, and one for uh, gay, because the hormones are different, right? So two women are going to have a vastly different hormone profile than two guys will versus a heterosexual couple. So it's all in the book. You can check it out. Oh, very, very cool. Okay, so... I, let's get into some of the nitty gritty around optimizing circadian rhythm, optimizing sleep. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, kind of regardless of chronotype, are there mm -hmm. practices that one can engage in to yes. help optimize those things? Absolutely. So if people get one thing from this whole podcast today, it's about consistency. Okay. Your body craves consistency, but more specifically, your brain does because your brain is, I mean, it's looking at a, a literally hundreds and hundreds of different functions every second. The more consistently you go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time, the better off you're going to be. Now, I am a six and a half hour sleeper. I have been almost my entire life. So first of all, eight hours is a myth. I want everybody out there to know that. If you need eight hours and you get them, that's great. But don't kill yourself for eight hours if you don't feel good after eight or you don't think that you need it. I go to bed at midnight. I'm up at 6.30. It works out perfectly for me because I only need six and a half hours. Are there some times I need a little bit more? Yeah, sure there are. But the more consistent I am, because let me tell you something. When I hit the pillow at like 12, 12, 15, I'm asleep in like five, 10 minutes mm. because my body knows it's supposed to be sleeping at this time. And I wake up without an alarm, sometimes even before 6.30. Like it just all of a sudden. So consistency, consistency, consistency is probably the biggest factor here. But there also, also are some environmental influences that are probably worth mentioning. So one of those is blue light. So you've probably all heard all kinds of stuff about, oh, my phone has got light and my Laptop has got light and my iPad has got light. Well, they do. And it turns out that the light that is emitted, there's a particular frequency at 460 nanometers. Um, that light hits very specific cells in your eye called melanopsin cells. And these turn off the melatonin faucet. Well, it's hard to have the melatonin faucet going 
um, and wake up in the morning. And you need the melatonin faucet at night. So again, that timing is going to be important. So you really want to limit any blue light exposure that you have um, in the evenings as best you can. So, okay, Michael, how the heck am I supposed to do that? Well, there's a couple of different ways. So number one, if you're using a laptop, there's a computer program called Flux. It's just F-L-U dot X. You can Google it or whatever. Um, it's free. You download it and it works like a charm. It really does a great job of lowering those levels of blue light. If you're, let's say you're watching something on your laptop or you're doing work late at night, that kind of stuff. Um, your phone, uh, there are some, pro some software programs inside the phones. They don't work great, okay? Um, all they do is lower the brightness. They don't necessarily change the frequency because that's a, that's a different aspect of light. Um, but they're better than nothing. And um, uh, what I do for my kids is I have them wear blue blocker glasses. Um, and do your kids I, actually wear them? My son loves them. Oh, and I'll tell you, nice. it's, it's really interesting. Um, so I gave them to him. So it's easily 75% of his schoolwork is done on his computer. And he, he comes home after school. He takes a nap for usually an hour, hour and a half, sometimes even a little longer, depending. He's still growing. Um, then he wakes up, has dinner, and then he starts doing his homework. So his homework really starts around 8.30 at night. And he's like this on the computer screen. And his eyes were starting to hurt him. So I said, I'm going to give you these special glasses that will help you with your eyes. And so I gave him blue blocker glasses. Mm. And he, he loves them now. He keeps them by his bedside. I walk in. He's, he's got them on. I don't even have to tell him. And because the eye strain is less, it really yeah. makes his eyes feel better. Mm -hmm. And then I say, look, just keep them on until you fall asleep because, and I explained to him about all the blue light. And so he does. Um, there are a lot of different blue blockers out there. Um, I just, um, I, I personally have used, uh, there's a, a friend of mine here in Los Angeles. He makes them. His name is James Swanwick and he makes these called Swannies. Um, mm -hmm. my kids like them because they're kind of fashionable. They look yeah. like, you know, like Ray-Bans or whatever. Right. But there's a new one that just came out that's called True Dark. Um, these are freaky looking, but they are, they're like, they're like noise cancellation for your eyeballs. Okay. Are they really? Yeah, I was wondering about that because they, they make some interesting claims on their site that yeah. are not really from, I mean, I've looked at the, the evidence quite a bit and I, I mean, I don't really see the evidence for some of the claims that they're making. So I, I'm glad you're bringing that up. Mm -hmm. so, so here's what's interesting. So I haven't checked out their science yet. All I have is I got a pair of the glasses and I used it on my flight. So I just got back from Europe so I flew, I'm in Los Angeles, I flew 10 and a half hours to London um, on the way there. And I wore them on the way there. I fell asleep within 30 minutes of getting on the airplane, which was my goal. And um, I slept for five and a half hours, no problem. And when nice. I woke up, I took the glasses off. Honestly, I was, I was a little shocked. I felt great. Wow. Um, I had very little jet lag when I got there. Now, granted, I know what I'm doing with jet lag, and so I had melatonin that I could take, you know, after I got there, but I have to tell you, it definitely slowed down the jet lag that I normally would have experienced, even with the, the knowledge base that I have, um, pretty significantly. So for me, and of one, you know, one test subject, yeah. um, I was very surprised, but it actually worked quite well. Interesting. Now, are they more reddish glasses that also they're block? They're super red. I mean, okay. they're not reddish. They're red. Okay. So um, they, they really change your color perception, not like blue blockers, which just block like red. that isolate blues. They're also blocking out greens and, and some of the other parts of the spectrum. Oh, dude, these things, I mean, it's, it's like blood red. It's yeah. like everything you see is red. So the, you have to kind of get used to that. Like, to be honest with you, I don't know if I could watch television with them on. Right. Yeah. So uh, yeah. on this subject, I actually bought a pair of red laser glasses. They're mm -hmm. like glasses for, for like construction workers or yeah, something. Yeah, like you get at Home Depot. Yeah. People who work with lasers mm -hmm. of various kinds. Yeah. And um, I was using them for a while. And then I heard an interview with Alexander Wunsch. Do you know who he is? Um, I know his, I know the last name, but I don't know him. He's he's a, a German researcher who does a lot of work around light and yeah, and, and circadian, circadian, and circadian uh -huh. yeah. Um, and he mentioned something to the effect of thinking that it was not such a good idea to use the reddish glasses that are blocking so many parts of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't really elaborate so much on right. it, but I I mean, I just I was like, oh well, I trust this guy. You know, I assume he's he probably I mean, he right. knows like right. more about light than anyone I could think of. So. I mean, Probably. like, but, but you and him are, I mean, are right up there. So on the one yeah. hand, I got you recommending them and then yeah. him kind of saying, well, saying more, stay with the blue blockers. So here's what I would say is you got to do what you're comfortable with. Um, and for me, you know, I'm kind of a geek, right? I mean, 
I'm a sleep geek. I, I play with all these different, because people send me stuff all the time. You would be shocked at how much stuff shows up in my PO box. <laughs> um, and I try stuff because I want to, you know, I want to be able to talk to people intelligently and say, here's the science behind this. Here's what works. Here's what doesn't. When you have a total red lens, you block out a lot of other parts of the spectrum. Yeah. And so the question becomes, is that healthy or is that not healthy? And so depending upon the length of time that you're using them, I think that would determine the health factor. Mm -hmm. So again, as an example, when I'm on an airplane, throwing on the red lenses is fine for me um, because it, I'm not, I don't necessarily have to have that depth perception and the perception that would be required if I had all those other types of uh, frequencies heading into my eyeballs. Whereas at home, I might, ne I might, like I said with my son, I'm using the blue blockers for him. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really a matter of kind of figuring it out for yourself. Here's the good news. Either way, you're not going to hurt yourself yeah. um, for sure. And um, you will probably see a difference in the level of effectiveness. Also, it's, it, there is some data to suggest that it could have something to do with the number of rods and cones in your eyes. So, and you know, people with lighter colored eyes have different amounts of that than darker color eyes. So there could be a, a variable there that we're not even thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, consistency is huge. Consistency is huge. Uh, the good environment is good. Getting that blue light out of there if you possibly can. Um, that's going to be important. Caffeine is another one that I talk to people quite a bit about. Um, so turns out that the research is pretty consistent that there is actually different caffeine sensitivities for different people. So some people are really affected and some people not so much. Generally speaking, my general recommendation for people is do not drink caffeine after 2 p.m. if you can help it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, caffeine's got a half-life of anywhere from six to eight hours, depending upon how quickly of a metabolizer you are. So I, I just like it out of the system, at least half of it by 10 o'clock. So that way we give all of the people out there the opportunity <laughs> to be able to fall asleep caffeine-free. Um, now, I guarantee you there's somebody who's watching this or listening to this who's going to be like, yeah, that Dr. Bruce doesn't know what he's talking about. I can have three cups of coffee with dinner and fall right asleep. Yeah. So number one, you might be on that lower caffeine sensitivity scale that we were just talking about. But number two, if I attach electrodes to your head and you've got three cups of coffee on board, I guarantee you, you're not getting any deep sleep. Um, so remember, it's not just a quantity issue. Yeah. It's also a quality issue. And so for folks out there, when you're looking for ways to improve quality, um, number one, le you know, less blue light. Number two, less caffeine. Uh, number three is alcohol. Um, there's a really big difference between going to sleep and passing out right? And so we have to think through this idea. I don't have any problem. If you want to have a couple of glasses of wine with dinner, go for it. I think it's fine. But once you pass two, here's what ends up happening is your body actually doesn't get into as deep a stage of sleep. So that's where that quality aspect comes in. We want to be very, very careful. So my general recommendation is you want to stop drinking about two to three hours before lights out. So if your last glass of wine is at eight, um, and you had two, then by 10 o'clock, you're fine. If you had three, then by 11 o'clock, you're fine. Mm -hmm. If you've had more than three, eh, you're probably not in a good zone as far as sleep is concerned. And you need to probably investigate, like, why am I having more than three glasses of wine? Yeah. Um, the other thing is sunlight. Um, a great thing to do is when you wake up in the morning is get direct sunlight. Um, so first of all, th it's amazing how many people are vitamin D deficient um, in this country. And, and that has a lot to do with a lot of sunscreen and staying out of the sun. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things I tell people when you're an outdoorsman because you rock climb and you surf and, and you, you're, you appear to be pretty tan. So you, you get a lot. I mean, look at me. I'm like the whitest guy ever. You, you, you are outside. So you get that vitamin D. Um, I take vitamin D supplements. Um, and I'll tell you this, I find that um, the days that I miss them, it definitely affects my energy. But if, if people can, when they wake up in the morning, the first thing they should do is drink a bottle of water. The second thing they should do is stand in front of a window while doing it because they can get that direct sunlight. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I mean, there's, there's a couple issues that, you're, that are kind of wrapped up in there. One is uh -huh. vitamin D on the skin and, and get, right. or, or sorry, a UVB on the skin and synthesizing vitamin D. Right. And then the other thing is light in the eye setting circadian rhythm. Exactly. So, that's I mean, exactly. I, yes. Thank I you just, for clarifying that. But that's, that's an important factor for sure. Yeah. I just want to clarify to people oh, that yeah. taking a vitamin D pill is not a supplement for setting the circadian rhythm with uh, the right leg. Absolutely. I, I, you know what? I didn't say that correctly. So you're absolutely right. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. Good, good point. Okay. So um, consistency, uh, blocking blue light at night, bright light in the mornings. Yep. Um, you know, there was some interesting research on, uh, there was a hunter gatherer sleep study. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. a, the, a big one that came out last year, maybe the year before, okay. um, where they showed that temperature plays a big role in, oh, yeah. in setting circadian rhythm. 
Yeah. Well, because remember, your sleep circadian rhythm is based off of your core body temperature rhythm. And so when you're in situations where you're too hot or too cold, it will absolutely have an effect on your sleep. And we know this. I mean, think about it. Like uh, people don't sleep nearly as well in the summer as they do in the winter. Like when I, uh, so I used to have four sleep laboratories that I was in charge of with 12 beds, um, three beds, well, three and four in different, different configurations. And we always knew that our census would be up during the summer and down during the winter because people slept well in the wintertime, so they weren't coming in to have sleep studies done. And so temperature definitely plays a big role. It turns out so does ventilation um, and, uh, and so does air quality. Um, because you know, if, you're, if you don't have great air quality and you're in one room during the daytime, well, you get up and you move to the other room, you open a window, whatever, but once you're asleep, you're breathing and rebreathing that air and that quality of that air, I, I am convinced has a pretty big effect uh, on people, especially if you're in a place that's got mold um, or there's smokers or things of that nature. So I think those are definitely things, but temperature is a big one. Um, you really definitely sleep better in the cool. Turns out that there's a range somewhere between 65 and 75 degrees. Certain teams seem to be the best ambient temperature. So temperature of the room. Mm -hmm. um, but I will also tell you, this is kind of a little fun fact, if you get hot and you're sleeping, if you stick your foot out from under the covers, you will start to cool down pretty quickly. Do you ever do this? I usually will like uncover half my body. Uh -huh. So here's what's interesting. You don't actually have to uncover the whole half of your body. If you just stick your foot out, it turns out that the skin on the bottom of your foot is very different than the skin on the rest of your body because it doesn't have hair. And you actually dissipate heat much more quickly through your feet. And so that's oh, why if you just stick your foot out, you'll cool down pretty fast. Interesting. What do you think of those chili pads? Have you seen that? I like the chili pad quite a bit. Um, and um, I think that they've actually, that, that, that could be a very big help, especially for some people with insomnia, especially women who are going through menopause who have insomnia, that could be a real benefit. Okay. Um, two more quick questions for you. And I know we're running out of time here. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, um, one is the distinction between sleep time and sleep period. Do you, do you think that's an important distinction and like also is kind of wrapped up in the idea of um, are, are, we, are we more sleep deprived than our ancestors were just a couple of generations ago? Because I've kind of seen mixed data on that. Um, so let me ask you, let me answer the second question first. Okay. So I would argue, yes, we are more sleep deprived. Um, I think that has to do with our schedules. I think that has to do with artificial light exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that has to do with caffeine consumption. Um, I, I would argue that we're at epidemic levels for sleep deprivation okay. as it stands right now. Um, now, are our bodies evolving and adapting to some of that? Actually, they are. Um, okay. Our sleep need, I think, has also been changing over this kind of evolving over time. Um, but we're going to hit a bottom. You know what I mean? Like, we're going to hit this point where our bodies aren't going to evolve much more. And in fact, our sleep... Uh, you know, habits are going to be in conflict of what we're trying to accomplish here. So, I mean, if I had to give everybody a message here, I would say, look, if you wake up in the morning and you feel good, then you've probably slept the right amount for you. Okay. And you need to think through that idea. Everybody has an individual sleep need. Um, so mine happens to be six and a half hours. Yours might be seven hours. My wife's might be nine hours, right? It's genetic. It's genetically predetermined. Some people hit the genetic lottery, you know, and are short sleepers and only need three and a half hours a night. Let me tell you something. You think that's really a good thing? I've talked to some of these people. They hate it. Um, mm. When you only sleep three and a half to four hours a night, you have 20 hours a day. Okay. <laughs> Nobody can read that many books. Nobody can watch that many videos. Nobody can talk to that many people on the internet. They get bored, they get depressed, and they get lonely. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these people, trust me, you don't want to be a short sleeper. Um, but I would argue that, yes, generally speaking, our sleep time is starting to crunch a little. Um, and I would say that, yes, we are seeing a pretty high level of sleep deprivation um, in, in societies. Um, interestingly, some societies worse than others. Um, so some cultures value sleep a lot more. So if you go into the Latin American cultures, they have siestas and all that kind of stuff. And that actually works out quite well for them. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at some of those hunter gatherer um, groups, um, they actually sleep for extended periods of time. So um, it really depends upon, I think, where you are on the evolutionary scale as to the sleep uh, deprivation that number one, your body can handle and number two, um, that it affects you. Um, okay. Oh, one last point that's important to make is for humans, the more sleep deprived you get, there's a part of your brain that tells you you're not tired. 
Um, and that's where it gets quite dangerous, right? And so this is something that came back from way back in caveman days where um, if you were getting tired and there was a saber-toothed tiger chasing you, uh, you really shouldn't lie down and have a nap. And so it doesn't give your brain a whole lot of good stuff to say, oh, you're sleepy, stop. And so that, that bypasses that mechanism and that's still part of our world. And so the problem is, is you don't realize how sleepy you are until you hit the wall. Yeah. And then you get really tired really quickly. And that can be, that can be dangerous. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. That's super important. So last question for you. Um, waking up in the middle of the night, some people wake up very consistently around 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Yep. Why does that happen? And okay. what should they do when they wake up? So nobody knows 100%, right? Let's just start with that. Um, I will tell you what some of my theories are. So first of all, remember, everybody wakes up three to four times a night anyway. Um, you don't remember it. You have, your body has to be actually, our brain rather has to be awake for a full 30 seconds for you to remember that you're actually awake. Um, so, and especially if you're a side sleeper, because you get what's called capillary crush, like you're kind of leaning on that side and it, it, it slows blood flow. So you have to wake up to turn over and, and kind of move around. That's part of what's going on. Um, I personally think there's a blood sugar issue going on. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that people haven't had anything, you know, you're, you're basically fasting, um, from dinner until you wake up in the morning, um, unless you're eating midnight snacks or whatever. And so we see blood sugar spiking. Uh, I think that can have something to do with it, especially if you have like a lot of sweets before bed. What I see ends up happening is you get this huge blood sugar spike and then it dumps and then you wake up at three o'clock in the morning and your brain's like, where's all the sugar? Like mm -hmm. I'm looking for sugar right now. And so one of the things I've wondered and I think we'll, we'll see over the course of time is as we look at low sugar diets or dietary regimens, I think that will help people sleep over time. Yeah, yeah, interesting. I've, I've definitely seen... In, in my experience that people who have poor metabolic health have trouble maintaining their energy during, even during the day, mm -hmm. um, during extended periods without eating. So, I mean, it only makes sense that during the nightly fast, you know, kind of the same ideas would apply. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, that's well, my dogs barking. <laughs> they're barking at you to finish the interview. They are. Well, well, thank you so much, Dr. Michael Bruce. Thank you. I really appreciate this. And, and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure interviewing you and, and getting you to share your wisdom with my oh. audience. Well, dude, this is my pleasure. I loved it. I had a great time. I'd love to come back and talk more sleep. Uh, and hopefully people got their sleep questions answered. Um, if not, ping them over to Ari and we'll see if we can get them answered for you. Yeah, for sure. And, and one final thing, make sure you go to the power of when quiz dot quiz. Is it, is it dot quiz? It's power of when quiz dot com. com. Okay. The power of when quiz dot com. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, man. Hey there, this is Ari Witten with the Energy Blueprint. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I assume you did, otherwise you probably wouldn't have stuck around this long. So in that case, I wanna make sure that you go over to theenergyblueprint.com and enter your name and email address so that you're on our email list and you get all the latest and greatest information as we release it. Theenergyblueprint.com is the number one source for information on the science of overcoming fatigue, and enhancing your energy levels. So make sure you head on over to theenergyblueprint.com, enter your name and email address, or just your email address, and sign up for our email newsletter where you'll get all the latest information, all the latest podcasts, all the latest articles and videos as we release them on the subject of increasing your energy levels. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon.